It's not unmuted. Hey, everybody. Come on, let's stand together and let's worship. Yeah. Blessing, honor, strength, and power. Yours alone now and forever. Love this world can never stop. Cause there is no one like our God. Reaching down to touch the broken. Mercy breaking through this moment. Good morning, Eastside. We are so glad that you could be here with us today. If this is your first time at Eastside, we want to take a moment to say thank you for joining us today. Check the back of the seat in front of you for a connection card. After service, Drop your connection card off at the Information Center in the West Lobby. There you'll be able to ask any questions about Eastside that you might have. Also, we want to give you a gift to let you know that you are always welcome here. Eastside is a place that has been used by God for over 30 years. It's a place that impacts lives, families, and is on a mission to help people discover and rediscover Jesus Christ. Eastside is special, and well, we love it here. 
That's why we are currently going through our I Love Eastside series. For the last two weeks of this series, we're going to see how God is using the church to move in the lives of those around us and discover new ways we can be a part of God's work that He's doing here. We are still selling our Eastside t-shirts for $10 this week. Make sure you stop at the table in the East Lobby by the cafe to grab yours. Also, we'll be giving out free car decals at each exit when you leave today. We love Eastside so much, make sure you grab one to show that you love Eastside too. Cooler air is coming in and we know that you've got a pumpkin spice latte on your way to church. That means one thing, fall is here. Fall time is a really amazing time here at church because we have so much going on. One of those things is our annual trunk or treat. For the next month, we'll be having a donation tub in the West Lobby. This is so that you can play a part in creating a fun, safe environment for our ES kids. Simply bring any candy donation on Sunday and drop it off in the tub on your way into the auditorium. We also need people to decorate trunks. To register your trunk, simply sign up at the table in the West Lobby. There will be prizes for the best trunks, so you won't want to miss out. Car enthusiasts and automotive aficionados, Saturday, October 6th was made just for you. The 9th Annual Classic Wheels Car Show is taking place right here at Eastside. Registration and a free breakfast begin at 8 o'clock, with the show starting at 10. This year we'll be raising money for Answering the Call, a charity for fallen officers and their families. If you would like more information, you can call the church office or email at office at ESBC.com. On October 20th, Harvesters will be providing a mobile pantry for those in our community that are in need of assistance. This is an opportunity to love those in our community and help fulfill the mission of the church. Email Pastor Don at don.clappin at ESBC.com to sign up. If you'd like to be part of our next Financial Peace class, be sure to mark your calendars for Thursday, October 11th. This class is designed to help people learn how to budget, eliminate their debt, and begin to save for their future. Class is held on Thursday nights at 7 p.m. and will go for nine weeks. To register, simply email the church office at office at ESBC.com. Lastly, registration for the Design for Life conference is still open, but the deadline of October 3rd is quickly approaching. To get all the information and register, please visit ESBC.com slash events. You won't regret taking part in an awesome event. Hi, my name is John Pritchard. I've been a member here at Eastside for 15 years, and most of that time I've served as a deacon and also a member of the financial team here at Eastside. I'm a certified public accountant. I've worked in public accounting my entire career now, almost 40 years. Hello, my da name's Dan Schick, and I've been a member of Eastside since 1987. I uh, I've been a certified public accountant since 1985, and uh, I've been been involved probably since late 90s to early 2000s with the, the financial aspects of Eastside. And in that process, we we spend a lot of time each year going through uh, the proposed budget, and uh, it's always uh, rewarding to see uh, uh, the, the amount of work the staff goes through to prepare the budget for our review. There's never a situation where where um, we ask a question and they can't find the, the details. They, they are very detail-oriented as far as where the money is being spent. It's awesome to see the, the, the funds that, that the members give uh, and how it's put to work throughout the community and the, and the world. There's been a lot of stories in the news over the past few years of, of problems with giving to different nonprofit organizations and people are concerned about the accountability and the security of their gifts. I want to tell you that we have we have uh, checks and balances in place here. We have uh, procedures in place here that prevent that sort of thing. Being able to see how that money is used is what's uh, most rewarding. I know over the last year, I think uh, we've done a done a, uh, a good job of of starting to share some of the things that that East Side does with with the the uh, the money. There's there's a there's a core fixed amount of expenses that that have you know, paying, paying for the light bills, et cetera. But over and above that, uh, being able to uh, uh, really further God's kingdom is, it gives, gives uh, a lot of satisfaction as an individual giving, giving those funds. Well, good morning, side. We're so glad you're here today, and we're thrilled that you can just be able to worship with us. And uh, this weekend, I got to go down to Arkansas. I was doing some motorcycle riding. All right, I got Arkansas'd by those people down there, and we went down to Bikers, Blues, and Barbecue. And as we were coming back yesterday, we were with a couple that we had spent the weekend with, and uh, we were coming up this way, and their truck had some issues. 
some problems that they have. And if you know me, I'm not a mechanic, okay? I have no mechanical ability. I start saying stupid things like, is your flux capacitator good? Is your rotor gooder tater good? You know, and I'm telling you, I'm the kind of guy, if you put your tools at my house, they'll be the same way that you left them when you come and pick them up, all right? I'm that guy. But what I did yesterday is I got to be a guy that was the runner. I'm good at that. You know, and so I got to be the runner. There were some things they needed. I got to run and get it for them and bring it back and do that. And you know what? I felt like I was contributing. I felt like I was contributing. And it made a difference. And the truth is, I got to thinking about it as I was leaving. I thought to myself, you know what? When we give to an organization like Eastside, even no matter what you give, no matter how small, how big, giving is contributing. And when you do that, you get to be a part of that and contribute. Now, I wasn't the guy that saved the day. I wasn't the guy that, as soon as I walked away, that vehicle started and they pulled off. But I contributed. And I got to be a part of that. And it made a difference. And later on, just about then, about an hour later, they were on the road and getting going. But I got to be a part of that. And so I'm telling you today, I encourage you, as you give, not because, like they said, we take their money and, and spend it. Unwisely, we take the money there that you give to use it to further God's kingdom. And not for today's generation or today's people sitting right here, but we're looking towards the future of what we can do and what Eastside can be in this community. And so I applaud you and I thank you for what you do and encourage you to keep contributing because it does make a difference and we're changing lives here in Jackson County and further out. All right? <laughs> Ushers, come ahead. We'll receive our tithes and our offerings. Let's pray. God, we thank you for the opportunity to be a church that makes a difference where we're at. We thank you that we're an we have the opportunity to be a church that is looking ahead. It's not just today, but we're looking for the future. But Lord, we need contributions. We need things, and we need to be a part of that. And if, if we get involved in it, even no matter how small, you'll take it and use it. Just like yesterday. It was a small thing I got to be a part of, but I felt like I was a part of it. And so I ask you, God, as we give, no matter what we give, that we walk away knowing that we're a part of something that is life-changing. We're a part of something that makes a difference. We're a part of something that is not only making a difference today, but is going to make a difference in the future. And so as we give towards that, God, I ask you that you'll take it, double it, triple it, use it for your glory. And when we walk out of here today, we can know, hey, listen, God, we are so glad to be a part of what you're doing. We love you, Lord, for who you are and what you do. You're the best. Amen. Receive buried in sorrow. You 
will call forth in its time. You are Lord, Lord of the harvest, calling our hope now to rise. Come on, stand. We receive your rain. And lift that up to him this morning. And tell him that we receive it, God. All of us. Yes. We receive your rain. Oh. We receive your rain. We receive your
on Church Hunters. This is your first church. This is Creekside First Baptist. Honestly, right up front, uh, didn't love the name. The Sunday morning experience was just a little too traditional. Hey guys, how we doing? Hey, good, doing how are good, you? Doing good, doing good. So I know you didn't love the traditional vibe of the last place, okay? Yeah. okay? But I think this church is really gonna do it for you. Yeah. It takes relevance to a whole new level. Behind me, you will see molded clay, jar art, tapestry, canvas, mosaic wow. church. Mm, I love beautiful. it. Right? 
So you've, you've heard of interdenominational, mm-hmm. right. and you've heard of non-denominational. Mm-hmm. Well, this church identifies as interdenominational. Oh. Wow, that's, that's perfect for it. us. It really is. But here's it. the kicker. A lot of celebrities go here. Yeah. What? Jeff Foxworthy. <laughs> we love him. Yep. We really do. Ben Higgins from ABC's The Bachelor. <gasps> perfect. Several Real Housewives. Ooh, I and know. Usher even came here one time. <laughs> yeah. Shut up. <laughs> yeah, well, wow. follow me. Come on. Let's do it. <laughs> so refreshing. Honestly, that last church was just way too traditional. It was yeah. too much. It was like we left there feeling convicted. Like, uh, ugh, right? Right. We're just, we're looking for more of a Tony Robbins type sermon. Like inspiration, like a TED Talk with a Bible verse. Yes. Oh, yes. Right? It's perfect here. We love it. It really is. We love it. Awesome. Cool. Well, you guys know a lot of contemporary pastors speak out of the Message Translation Bible. Mm -hmm. Right. Or this pastor speaks out of a brand new translation. It's the Tumblr Bible. Shut up. We love Tumblr, though. This is great. A lot of emojis, a lot of abbreviations. Oh, I couldn't ask for one. And how many seats in here? Oh, it is 6,000 altogether. Babe, 6,000. I got to be in this worship band. Imagine me up on that jumbotron mid-guitar solo. Do you know how many Instagram likes you get? Oh, Oh, my God. We find it hard to find a church right now because I grew up Catholic. I grew up and Baptist, so so like we we drink. Yeah, but just in private. I mean, obviously you get it. Basically, in terms of like worship, I think we're looking for like a Jesus culture type feel. Oh, I right. love them. Hillsong, obviously. Oh, obviously, we do the cross. Hillsong is great. Like a Bethel minus the spontaneous yeah. stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Just for me, I connect in worship more when the leader is attractive. Personally, I'm a Carrie Job guy. Well, she's married. So. Um, so is Christian Stanfield. Wow. <laughs> so one of my personal favorite things about this church is the service times. Okay. There's an 8.30, a 10, a 1 o'clock, a 5.30, and even a 7 o'clock service. Oh, there's nothing around like 2-ish? Yeah, for us, for what we need, 2, 2.15 is best. Yes. Uh, how many songs do they do during worship? Usually five, five and a half, depending on where the spirit leads. Oh, wow, babe, is that, is that a lot? Well, if that's too that much for you, they like... have a program here called the Worship Assist Program. Okay. So if you ever get tired during worship, an intern will come out and just hold your arms up. You just keep worshiping the King of Glory. Just like that. Wow. I love it. Oh, you can still look super spiritual. Hmm? And my arms get so tired from yoga. Oh, same. I actually like this church. I think we can make it work. It was all right. I mean, it was it was good, but pers- like I emailed the pastor and he didn't immediately respond. So uh, we're taking these vessels elsewhere. Oh man! Good morning. That's so funny to me. I love those because there's so much truth in the middle of all that humor. Uh, but anyway, we've been showing a couple of those in our series, uh, I Love Eastside, and this is part four of our series. I want to jump right into it because we've got a lot to cover today, and uh, I'm actually today continuing a message that we started last week, uh, so we're going to jump into that, and here's what I shared a little bit from last week. These are not in your notes. Some of this is not in your notes because it was there last week. I encourage you to go back online. Uh, you can go online. Uh, you can go to our to YouTube. Eastside has a YouTube channel. You can watch the service there. I shared with you what to look for in a church. If you're looking for something in a church, I shared what to look for. I, d- I didn't come up with this. I don't know where I found it exactly, but uh, here's what you, you look for. But I really resonate with it. I thought it was a great one to share with you. Um, what do you look for in a church? People who love Jesus, all right? And most churches, most every church would check that box, wouldn't they? Most every church would go, yeah, we love Jesus. Uh, number two, people who love like Jesus. Now, now, most churches would check the box and say, well, we're working on it because we're kind of a work in progress. But most churches would go, yes, that's, we, we're in complete agreement with the, that one. But here's, here's the kicker, and here's why I shared it with you. Number three, people with a plan to inspire the next generation to love and to love like Jesus. And I, I'm just here to suggest to you that most churches couldn't check that box. But I said to you last week, one of the reasons I love Eastside is because we can check that box also. There is a plan to inspire the next generation to love Jesus and to love like Jesus. And somebody goes, well, what's your plan? What is this plan that you're talking about? Well, that's what this message is about last week and this week. This, 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 the messages uh, this week and last week are a big part of that plan. This is what I am, am talking about as uh, we continue with that uh, idea that we started last week. Now, here's what we, we've so far, so far. Uh, we said we love Eastside because uh, we are the body of Christ, right? And we said this, we don't simply go to church. We, Okay, that was very poor, 
All right, we're going to try again. Don't simply go to church. Be the church. I mean, that, that's kind of the idea we said. And then the second week, I said this. I said that we love Eastside because we're a community. And uh, a life-giving, healing community. And we said this. We is more powerful than... So, so we love Eastside. We need community. God ordained us to be in community, created to be in community. And then last week, I began to and want to finish today. The message that uh, I started last week was this. I love Eastside because we don't freak out about doubt. All right? We don't freak out about doubt. And uh, I, I shared this also last week, and I find it alarming. Uh, one of the statistics says this. That in evangelical churches like ours, evangelical churches like ours, three-fourths of the students in churches like ours abandon their faith after high school. Three-fourths of students attending churches like this one abandon their faith when they leave high school. Matter of fact, I had a friend of mine, uh, Paul sent me a, a, after the message Sunday, Monday or Tuesday, he sent me this, uh, it was a blog, and he sent me part of it, and I wanted to include it up here as part of the message today. It was a, it was a blog about, here, listen to this, it was a blog about ex-evangelicals. Do you understand what that means? I mean, we would be considered an evangelical church, we would. But this was a church, this is an article about ex-evangelicals. It, it's, it's an article about those individuals who are actually leaving evangelicalism. And here's what it says. But one criticism stands out as nearly universal. And here it is. I never felt like I could ask questions. I never felt like I was allowed to wonder why. And I will say to you again, the statistics bear this out. After the first service today, one of the first couples that grabbed my hand, an older couple shook my hand and said, Oh, this is the very reason my kids don't go to church today. I begged them to come and listen to this. This is a serious deal. And I love Eastside because Eastside, we don't freak out about doubt. And I began to, to lay that argument out last week. And here's what I said. And again, not in your notes, just a little bit of a review beginning last week. Faith is not the antithesis of doubt. Doubt is not the opposite of faith. I was raised in a church environment under this false assumption that my faith was only as strong as it was free of doubt. Do you understand what I'm saying? My faith was only as strong as I was free of doubt. And so that was kind of the environment that I was raised in. And that causes a couple of things to happen. It causes some individuals who have doubts to walk away because their doubts are not welcomed. Uh, initially it might be, but once you've been in the church long enough, you're supposed to, to know stuff and you don't question anything. Or it causes individuals in order to become a part of the group, just to take all of their questions and all of what they wrestle with and just push it down, ignore it, and then just to go along with the crowd and just ignore all the questions that they might have. And I'm saying we're missing that opportunity to wrestle with our faith and grow. But I'm also telling you that the generations coming up, they're just walking away. They don't give the opportunity to ask questions. They walk away. And I've told you this before, and I'll say it again. Churches might be afraid of questions, but God's not. God welcomes them. He welcomes our wrestling. Matter of fact, I said this last week. Scripture, over and over again, Scripture views our willingness to wrestle with God. And I use that phrase, wrestle with God, because we looked at the story. of When Israel got its name, it got its name after a wrestling match. In the Bible, wrestling with God. You say, I'd like to know about that. Listen to last week's, all right? Willingness uh, to wrestle with God as praiseworthy. Scripture says it's a good thing to wrestle with God. And I showed you examples of it over and over again. Remember, God praised Job for wrestling with him. Yet God said to the three friends of Job's, God didn't have good praiseworthy things to say about them because they were just certain. They knew all the answers. They knew exactly why God was doing what he was doing, but they were flat out wrong. Job asked questions also. 
but, but he did it with an honest heart. And God said to him, I appreciate Job. He wasn't right in his accusations about me, but he was honest. And God was okay with the psalmist asked questions, the prophets asked questions. Over and over again, we looked at the willingness of those in Scripture to ask questions. I, and I say this, I ask this question, why, why is it that they were so willing to ask questions? Why? Where does this come from? And I believe, I believe their willingness to ask questions and to wrestle with God is because at the end of the day, they believed that God was faithful. Even though they didn't understand everything. Even though they looked at stuff and they go, this just doesn't make sense. In the end, they believed God was faithful. I want to tell you this for me, just for me right now. This is just, I'm just speaking on behalf of Fred right now. I am very comfortable of asking questions because at the end of the day, I believe God is good. I believe that God is like Jesus. Jesus said, I and the Father of one. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. I know what Jesus is like, and Jesus was good through and through. And I may not understand everything, and I may wrestle with stuff, and I go, I don't understand this. But one of the reasons I can do that is because when the, everything is said and done, I believe in the goodness of God. And I think that's one of the reasons why they were able to wrestle with it. Now, let's continue on. Let's make some observations. These will be in your notes now. Let's go. Jesus, while Jesus was here, Jesus warned of being overly bound by religious traditions. Jesus said, be careful of religious traditions. Look at this. In Mark chapter 7, 8, and 9, it says this. Jesus said, for you, in the red, say it with me, for you ignore, you ignore God's law and substitute your own what? Traditions. Then he said, you skillfully sidestep God's law in order to hold, back, uh, to hold on to your own traditions. We've got to be very, very careful that the things that, we, that, that we're holding on to so tightly, is it really, thus saith the Lord, or is it our own tradition? Handed down to us from men. Jesus said, be very, very careful. But, 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 okay, you say, well, how do we know if it's tradition or not? No, well, you ask some questions. That's one way. And you wrestle with it a little bit. That's one way. But, but here's what I want to share with you. And, and maybe I should have taken more time uh, to develop this, although I will tell you next year you can expect a whole series on this subject. And I'll just unpack it, Scripture verse by Scripture verse. We need to do that. Okay, you ready? Did you realize that when Jesus walked the earth, he questioned the Jewish Scriptures? The Hebrew Scriptures that the Jewish people had, the old, what we call the Old Testament, they, the Jewish scriptures, Jesus questioned it. You say, where did he question the scripture? You ever heard on the Sermon on the Mountain? I don't know why it's called Sermon on the Mountain, because he preached several sermons on mountains. But this one's called the Sermon on the Mount. Read Matthew 5, 6, and 7. And here, if you don't see, if you don't find verses like this where Jesus said, you have heard it said in your scriptures, but I say. And a couple of times, you know what he says? Your scriptures don't go far enough. At one point, he says this, your scriptures say eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. But I say, turn the other cheek. Don't return evil for evil. Well, what right does he have to question the scriptures? Well, you say, well, because he's Jesus, Pastor. You're not. Thank you. I get that. Thank you for pointing that out. But here's what we understand. Jesus caused his audience to wrestle with the Scripture. He caused them. They had to look at By the way, the early church wrestled with Scripture. Did you know that? It's in your Bibles. Well, for those of you that like homework, would you read Acts chapter 15? Would you read about this Jewish... Can, can I just tell you real quick? There was this council in Jerusalem that the early church was wrestling. Here's what they were wrestling with. There were Jewish Christians, some of them Pharisees, who had become followers of Jesus, and they had all their Jewish laws and regulations. And then these Gentiles were believers coming in, and the Jewish people were saying, they have to follow Moses' law also. I mean, we had to go through all those animal sacrifices and all those temple feasts, and we had to, the men had to get circumcised. Some of you are like, did he just mention that? I did. And they were like, and they're going like, these new people get to come in and they don't have to do any of that? No way. 
And so they were wrestling. What does the Bible really say? And they come up with this conclusion. It's in Acts chapter 15. You can read it. We should not put more on to the Gentile believers than what is supposed to. But then they added three rules because they're a good church. But word came back to the Gentile believers. You don't have to be circumcised. And all the Gentile men went, praise God. It's in there. It's in your Bibles. This is there. And they were continually asking questions. And then the Apostle Paul said this to us in 1 Thessalonians 5, 21. But, he said, say this with me. Test. Say it again. Oh, let's do it one more time. Test everything. Now, that is said, hold on to what is good. Get rid of bad ideas. But hold on to what's good and right. Now, how do you test things? Well, I know. I know when I was in college, professors knew how to test me. When I was in high school, teachers knew how to test me. You want to know how they tested me? They asked me questions. What do you know about this? What is this? And they would ask questions to discover what you know. That's how you test things. You test them by asking questions. Where did the church get the idea that we can never look at something and ask a question? Now, Here's why. Because many are afraid of doubt because our questions are mystery because of what's called the slippery slope argument. You say, Pastor Fred, what do you mean? What do you mean slippery slope argument? Everybody knows what happens to somebody who steps on a slope that is slippery. Here, here, let me show you. There you go. That's what happened. Let's watch it again because it's so much fun. He's gone. All right. How many of you have had that experience? Have you ever been there? You step on a slippery slope and down you go and everybody's going, but Pastor Fred, you're stepping on a slippery slope and you're leading the church to stand on a slippery slope and we're just going to fall down and we're just going to crash at the end. It's the slippery slope. Argument. I think it's a legitimate concern. I think it's a legitimate question. But the question is this, Pastor Fred, if I let go of something or if I question something, how can I be sure I'm not going to lose everything? If I doubt this one thing that I've been taught or that the church, how do I know I'm not going to end up doubting everything? And I would simply say that just because you doubt one thing doesn't mean it all falls. We can let go of bad ideas without letting go of everything. We need balance here. By the way, church, I just want to say this to you. You should never fear modifying your belief if you have sufficient reason to do so. Nobody changes just for change. Nobody's just going, I'm just up for a change. I think I'll change my belief. No, if you've been given sufficient reason to do so, don't be afraid to modify your belief. Where did we come up with this? By the way, here's where the young people, this is where it's dangerous with the, particularly the new generation. If you and I make it an all or nothing argument, it could very well be nothing. If we say you have to believe everything right here or nothing, then it very well be, may be nothing at all. And you say, Pastor Fred, can you give me an illustration? Thanks for asking. Many young people today will question Many churches hold to uh, the book of Genesis a six-day literal young earth creation. And if you don't agree with that, then you are just, you're doubting this and you're questioning this wrong. I want you to know something. You can question that and doubt that and still be a follower of Jesus. You can. Matter of fact, I do. 
I can doubt that. I can look at that and say, I think we just need to look at this and what is what's being said here. Somebody says, Pastor Fred, I read about the universal flood, but I, I have questions and what science has said, and I have questions. Am I, am I allowed to come and be a part of church because I doubt some of this? Yes! It's okay to ask questions. You don't have to deny everything by asking a question. Pastor Fred, you're just... You're just, this is just some kind of new progressive Christianity and it's a new approach. And it's, let me just say something to you right now. Please, you want to know why people say that? It's because they don't know their history. They do not know their history. Because in church history, churches were allowed to ask questions. Have you ever heard of something called the Protestant Reformation? Well, I wasn't just here to tell you. Thank God some people were asking questions. Thank God for a group of people that asked questions. And then in the midst of the Protestant Reformation, they made this statement, Ecclesia Reformata Semper Reformata. I expect you to remember that and come in quoting this next week, okay? I expect you to be able to say this. You say, what does that mean? It means this, the church reformed and always reforming. Now, you can put this in online, and some of you will, and you'll go Google it, and you'll find all kinds of preachers saying, oh, preachers use this and abuse it and everything else. But the truth is, the truth is, at least I think everybody in the room would agree with this. This statement of those who were the reformers during the Protestant Reformation captures the humility and the openness that the church has sought to advocate in the past. But we lost it. And then somebody comes along and says, we need to recapture it. And they're called the progressive. I'm saying we go back. I'm saying you want to go back. Let's go back. Let's go back when it was okay to ask questions in church. Because I'm going to tell you this. If we don't, there's going to be another generation that completely walks away from the church. And I've told you this before. I want Eastside to the place that reaches your kids and your grandkids and your great-grandkids. Now, number three, God works within the interaction of community. I need to make this point real quick, then I want to give you a Bible study to let you go. But uh, this is very, very important. And I invite everybody to listen very carefully. Our wrestling with questions about Scripture and about our faith should never be done in isolation. Whenever we wrestle with our faith in isolation, we come up with some really weird ideas. Some really weird ideas have happened when individuals go and they start questioning their faith in isolation. It should always be done in community. It should always be done with other believers. It should always be ran across. Listen, I have been on a journey for the past five years or longer. And this journey has led me to other believers and other followers of Jesus who are writing material and writing books and are wrestling with things. And it's not done in isolation. By the way, do you understand that you didn't come up with your faith on your own? Do we all get that in the room today? Those of us who, who, who embrace the faith, do you know that we didn't come up with this? It was handed down to us. The faith that we are following has been handed down from the apostles to the early church followers, through the church, through centuries, to nearly 2,000 years. That's why last week I did something different at Eastside. During baby dedication, we had all those beautiful babies and parents lined across the front. How many of you remember? You remember what I did? I read to them the creed and said, here's your faith. Handing down your faith. What does it mean to hand down your faith? Well, this is what they've been telling us for hundreds of years when they got together and they wrestled and they said, this is what is the core of Christianity. This is our faith. We believe in the Trinity. We believe in God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We believe that Jesus Christ is the living Son of God and He came to bear our sins and He is our salvation and He is the only way. We believe in the Holy Spirit. We believe that Jesus is coming back and boom, it's over. And you want to know how long it took me to read our faith statement in in the creed, a minute, 30 seconds. You want to know what churches do today? They don't follow the creed. They have statement of faith of about 30 things. And they say, if you don't agree with us on all of these, you can't be a part of us. And I'm simply saying, that's not the way the church was handled way in the past. The result 
over 30,000 denominations with new denominations starting every single day. And I'm just asking you, do we really think that's what Jesus had in mind? You say, but Pastor Fred, what if somebody comes up with a wacky idea? What if we're sitting around and somebody comes up with a wacky idea? Could we apply what in theological circles is referred to as the Gamaliel principle? And it comes from the book of Acts, chapter 5, verse 38. And, and the religious leaders are all upset about Peter and John. And oh my goodness, they're gonna, what are they going to do? And here's what Gamaliel stood up and said in the midst of this meeting. Uh, we would call it a business meeting today. Here's what he said in the midst of the business meeting. So my advice is, leave these men alone. Let them go. If they are planning and doing these things merely on their own, it will soon be overthrown. It won't last. Say this with me. But if it is from God, you will not be able to overthrow them. You may even find yourselves fighting against God. How many of you think that's good wisdom? This is some pretty good wisdom to apply to this. Now, let me do a little quick Bible study with you. You can worship Jesus and still doubt. You don't have to have it all figured out. You don't have to have everything answered. You don't have to be certain about everything. You can still doubt. Matthew chapter 28 records one of the most famous passages in all of the Bible, and it's preached in churches every single year. Most churches at least mention this verse at least once, if not multiple times every year. It's referred to as the Great Commission. Do you remember? Jesus looked at the disciples after he had risen from the dead, and he said, do you remember? Go into all the world, make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and teach them everything that I've taught you, and where you will be, I will be there with you always. It's called the Great Commission. How I many of you know that's awesome? I mean, it's an incredible passage, and the church is like, yeah, we love that passage. Well, can I read you the two verses right before it? Would that be okay? And I want you to see the context in which the Great Commission took place. And I don't think it's accidental. Here we go. I read to you 18, 19, and 20. Let's look at 16 and 17. Then the 11 disciples left for Galilee. Remember, this is the 11 disciples that after Jesus was crucified were, were most of them hiding behind closed doors and closed windows, right? Scared for their lives. Jesus is now risen from the dead, and he says, I want you to go to a particular mountain. We don't know where that's at. It's just one of the mountains. So the 11 disciples left for Galilee. They have an appointed meeting with Jesus. So they go to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshiped him. But, say it with me, some of them doubted. Now, I'm not a Greek scholar. There are some Greek scholars that say that phrase, some of them doubted, actually is better translated, all of them doubted some. But even if you go with some of them doubted, can I ask you a question? Bible, it's okay to ask questions kind of what we're talking about. So here's the question. If we, you and I were in a little Bible study, I'd ask you this question. What did they doubt? I'll just be honest with you. It doesn't say. It doesn't say. Maybe they doubted that Jesus really rose from the dead. Maybe when they saw Jesus, they doubted it, that it was really Jesus because he had appeared in between his resurrection and ascension at other times and people didn't recognize him. I mean, Mary Magdalene hung out with him all the time. And then after his resurrection, she saw him, thought he was a gardener. She didn't get it. Two disciples are walking along the Emmaus Road. Jesus walked right up and walked right alongside of them. Luke chapter 24, you can read it. They didn't recognize him. Some dudes were out fishing. The disciples were out fishing. Some dude is on the beach cooking breakfast. And they're like, who is that? Well, it was Jesus. They didn't recognize him. But they still went and ate because they were hungry. And they discovered it was Jesus. They didn't recognize him. Maybe they're doubting that it was Jesus. Maybe they doubt. Maybe they were doubting whether he really rose from the dead. But here's one. Maybe they doubted whether they should worship him or not. Because they've been taught all their lives, you only worship God. And there's only one God. So how can we worship Jesus? 
Maybe they doubted whether or not they should even be there because they ran from him at the time he needed them the most and they hid out in fear. Maybe they doubted their own capability of following Jesus. Maybe. So what did they doubt? Well, to be honest with you, Matthew doesn't make a big deal about it. Nor should we. Nor should we. Because here's what happened afterwards. The disciples still went into the world preaching the gospel. You say, Pastor Fred, what are you saying? Listen to this very carefully. Listen. Doubt didn't disqualify them. Did it? Their wrestling with what was going on did not disqualify them. And hear me, please, hear me, please. It does not disqualify you either. Just because you may not understand everything. I told you this last week. I said this last week. I believe that Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are all one God, three distinct separate persons, all one nature. I confess that. I believe it. You say, well, Pastor Fred, would you explain it? Can't. It's a mystery. I believe that Jesus left heaven and was fully God, 100% God, and at the same time, 100% human. Pastor Fred, could you explain that, please? Can't. I can't. Pastor Fred, when Jesus died on the cross, could you explain exactly everything that's happening there? No. Not everything. It's a little bit of a mystery. What happened when Jesus came forth from the grave? Oh, the resurrection. I could explain things that happened, but I can't explain everything. There's a little bit of mystery to it. Oh, I know that there are many preachers on TV and they are selling their books in the bookstores that tell you exactly how Jesus Christ is going to return and when it's going to happen and everything that will happen surrounding it. Here's what I'll tell you. Jesus Christ is returning it's just a mystery to me how it's all going to come about. But I'm comfortable with that. I'm okay. You know why? In the end, I believe that God is good. He's just like Jesus. So, three takeaways from this real quick and let you go. Number one, leave room for mystery in your faith journey. In your faith journey, would you just leave room for some mystery? It's okay. It's okay. You don't have to have all the answers. You don't have to have it all figured out. And you can still follow Jesus even when you don't. Even when you sit there and you go, I don't know about that. I wonder if I should come back. Yes, you should. Well, I don't even know if I believe any of it. Should I come back? Yes. I'm not sure I believe anything you're saying. Should I come back? Yes. It's okay. It's okay. By the way, let me just tell you something. The Apostle Paul, does everybody know who he is? The Apostle Paul wrote the majority of the New Testament. He had all the answers before he met Jesus. Oh, he had all the answers. He had it all figured out. He's willing to kill people over it. Because he knew exactly what God was like until he met Jesus. And then he went, oh man, I think I got this wrong. Oh man. Leave room for mystery in your faith. It's actually, just to be honest with you, can I tell you this? It's actually kind of fun. It's fun. I'll save it for my last point before I let you go here. I just want to say it so bad. Number two, value community. We already mentioned this one. Value community. Our wrestling with faith takes place in groups, in other believers, not in isolation, not on our own. You say, I'm not in isolation. I read the internet. Let me tell you something. You can go to the internet. You can type in everything I've said. You can find individuals that's just going to just tear it up, chew it up, and spit it out. They're all out there in the internet world. Best thing to do is to be able to sit down with a group of people who breathe, who are going through life and are wrestling with their relationships and wrestling with their lives and going through dark times and good times and, and see how faith works out in their world. 
That's community. And then number three, don't strive for certainty, but rather for commitment in the midst of uncertainty. In other words, if you think you're going to get it all figured out before you're just able to relax, you're going to be in big trouble or you can play the game and think you've got it all figured out. Now, I know you're done. Notes away. Someday I would like to probably stand up and explain this whole journey. But I will tell you this. For the last five years of my ministry life, I have asked more questions than I've asked in my previous ministry all put together. And I continue to ask them. You say, well, Pastor Fred, what has it done to your faith? Now, what has it done to my friends? A lot of them gone. What has it done to popularity? (laughs) Shot. What, What has it done to all of that? A lot of that. But let me just tell you what it's done to my faith. My relationship with Jesus Christ is more vibrant and more alive and more fresh and more exciting than it's ever been in my entire Christian life. Much more. My time with Jesus is is so wonderful because I don't have to go and pretend like I understand everything. I don't. I can even challenge And say, that doesn't make any sense to me. And wrestle. It's caused me to want to tell people about Jesus more. Because I realize how incredibly good and how amazing His grace really is. It's not just a song. It's not just a concept. It is a reality. The good news is really good news for everybody. Yeah. I don't know about you. I get a little pumped about it. I'll settle down until you think I'm crazy, maybe. Doubt can enhance your faith. It can enhance it. We've been taught to shut it down. At Eastside, we don't freak out about doubt. We embrace it. Would you bow your heads with me? I want to pray, and before we leave, let's pray together. And For anybody in the room that's saying, you know, I kind of would like to know more about this relationship with Jesus I hear so many talk about. Well, when you leave today at all the main exits, we have a little booklet called Fresh Start with God. That book is free, the very beginning of it, in a very concise, succinct manner, explains that to the best of my ability. Let's pray together. Father, we have walked into a subject now. We're talking about a subject that makes some, I realize, Father, I know it, it makes some individuals incredibly uncomfortable. Father, when I look into your word, it seems clear to me that when you came, You caused questions, lots of them. And the church wrestled with those questions and continued to wrestle with those questions. Yes, there were certain things that were solid that you, Lord Jesus, your Lord, that you came and in some way on the cross, somehow you bore our sin. Father, we have wrestled with understanding what all of this means. But we understand it and we believe it. We have those truths that we hold so dear. But outside of that, we're open to all kinds of questions. And even within that, we're just welcome the questions. Father, I pray that we wouldn't be afraid of doubt. And uncertainty. Because even the Christian who feels so certain today, you never know what life's going to hit him with. 
And Father, I know I've seen individuals who have been so certain in their faith one day lose it all the next. Father, I pray that as we move forward, you would use this congregation as we wrestle with the scriptures and we wrestle with what's taught. We would be a place where those who are seeking, those who have doubts, those who have questions will find a community where they are welcomed and accepted. Because that's that's exactly who you are. And we seek to represent you. Dismiss us now in your love, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all stand. If you're a guest with us today, thank you for being our guest. You are dismissed.